Society of the Snow is a 2023 survival thriller film. In this film, in 1972, the Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, chartered to transport a rugby team to Chile, experiences an unexpected incident and crashes into a glacier in the heart of the Andes. Of the 45 passengers on board, only 16 manage to survive. Trapped in one of the most inaccessible and hostile environments on the planet, they are forced to take extreme measures to stay alive. Their survival will depend on the decisions they make in the midst of this desperate situation. How they survive? Let's see. The old Christians Club rugby team engages in an intense match with rivals on the field. In a spirited moment, one of the younger players, Roberto, seizes the rugby ball and charges forward, resisting calls from the captain and senior players to pass it. Despite his efforts, Roberto is eventually tackled by the opposing team, mirroring the ultimate outcome of the match. Despite the team's significant loss. The atmosphere in the dressing room remains surprisingly upbeat. The young men are eagerly anticipating their next match, particularly because it is scheduled to take place in neighboring Chile. The prospect of playing overseas adds an adventurous twist to the upcoming game, creating genuine excitement among the friends. After thorough discussions among friends, the decision to travel to Santiago is solidified, and the day of the flight swiftly arrives. The plane departs from Uruguay with a total of 40 passengers, including 19 players from the Old Christians Club rugby team, along with five crew members. The journey proceeds smoothly until the midway point when passengers, in high spirits, capture moments with photographs, creating a joyful atmosphere among the youngsters. However, the mood takes a drastic turn as the plane approaches the Andes mountain range. Stormy winds and snow lead to significant turbulence, altering the course of the flight to avoid the towering mountains. The pilots decide to divert through a relatively open pass between two peaks. Unfortunately, a critical situation unfolds as the pilots lose control, resulting in the plane crashing into the snowy Andes. Within minutes of the plane crash, the unfortunate demise of the pilot occurred, and with the equipment rendered useless, all means of communication between the survivors and the outside world were severed. Despite attempts by some of the men to utilize the pilot's radio, the lack of power rendered the machine inoperable. The impact had caused the plane to break into two pieces upon landing on the thick, snow-covered mountains, with the tail separated and catapulted away from the very first night of their harrowing ordeal. The survivors recognized the need to huddle with the deceased bodies to shield themselves from the biting cold. The conditions were unforgiving, with temperatures plummeting within minutes after sunset, making it impossible to endure the elements without protective shelter. The broken half of the airplane served as their refuge, and in the initial days, the survivors clung to hope, anticipating rescue. The disappearance of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 had made headlines prompting authorities to initiate search efforts. Although the survivors heard planes flying overhead, the crash site's location, combined with heavy snow covering the terrain, made them nearly impossible to trace from above. The challenging angle of the crash site further complicated efforts to spot the survivors or the wreckage. Despite the rescue planes diligently scouring the area, the survivors remained elusive in the vast snowy landscape. The agonizing wait for assistance became unbearable due to the severe weather conditions and the collective injuries sustained by all the survivors, who had little respite beyond basic first aid. The most challenging aspect was the scarcity of food, as the group had insufficient supplies. Their meager rations quickly depleted, and only when the other half of the plane was discovered later did they gain access to additional, albeit meager, food items like chocolates. The desolate area, devoid of any animals or plants due to the extreme cold, heightened the difficulty of their predicament. In their delirious state, some began to believe that the location was inhospitable to life, lacking the means to sustain it. Despite these challenges, the group of survivors had no choice but to endure. Confined to the spot by the surrounding snow, preventing any considerable travel. As time passed, the situation became increasingly dire, leading the survivors to resort to the most dreaded source of sustenance, cannibalism. With dead bodies strewn about and no other viable food sources, the survivors, after attempting to consume inedible items like seat foam and leather, faced the grim reality of consuming the flesh of their deceased friends and co-passengers. The proposal initially met with moral and religious objections, as the act of consuming human flesh is considered both repugnant and sinful. Some refused to participate on these grounds, citing concerns about disrespecting the deceased passengers, who would not have consented to such a horrific act. Driven by insurmountable hunger and an unyielding will to survive, the survivors found themselves compelled to consume human flesh. To alleviate the moral burden, arrangements were made with utmost humanity, and the person responsible for preparing the meat discreetly kept the identities of the bodies undisclosed. As days passed without any prospect of external assistance, 
the survivors, facing the harsh reality of their predicament, collectively agreed to give posthumous consent for the use of their bodies, alleviating some of the guilt and pressure within the group. Despite the revulsion felt by many, they consumed the meat with heaps of snow to mask the taste. Enduring 72 days in the desolate, snow-covered Andes was an immense challenge. As recounted in the introduction of Society of the Snow, the feat was both fortunate and miraculous. The group salvaged electronic parts from the second crash site, constructing a makeshift radio in hopes of news about an impending rescue. However, the heartbreaking revelation arrived that no rescue operation had located them in the Andes and such efforts had been discontinued. This grim news coincided with perilous weather shifts, including snowstorms burying the airplane deep beneath the ground. Undeterred, the men maintained their resilience to survive, at times fueled by an almost uncontrollable spirit. While some awaited the resumption of search operations due to physical limitations, a faction of the rugby team friends decided to embark on long-distance hikes, seeking help beyond the barren expanse of the Andes. On the 36th day post-crash, Roberto, Nando, Tintin, and Numa ventured eastward, aiming to traverse the mountain ranges and reach Chile beyond the imposing Andes. Early on, Numa had to abort his journey due to a severe foot infection from a previous injury, returning to the airplane. Undeterred, the remaining trio pressed forward and discovered the broken tail of the airplane. They attempted to use salvaged parts to establish contact with civilization amid enduring snowstorms and harsh weather. When Numa, a cherished member of the group, succumbed to his circumstances, the others decided to embark on the eastward journey once more. With winter behind them and the sun growing brighter, Roberto, Nando, and Tintin encountered improved weather conditions. Despite facing strong winds and snow on the Argentinian side of the Andes, their proximity to the border between Argentina and Chile made Expedition East a plausible plan. The group, walking miles through the mountain range, reached the highest point, revealing an open valley below, a promising path to Chile and human settlement. To conserve food rations, Tintin returned to the crash site, while Roberto and Nando persisted in their original mission to seek help for the survivors. A powerful moment occurs when Roberto and Nando spot a lizard, a sign that they are finally in a place where life thrives. While Nando is fascinated by the lizard, Roberto is surprised by another sight, a man on horseback, looking at them with confusion. They quickly explained who they were, and the villager took them to the village. From there, they contacted Uruguayan authorities for help, and the courageous expedition east led to their successful rescue.